Good morning. Is everyone awake yet? No, I'm not. Maybe we should just take a nap, you know. Be a well, thank you for being here sort of an hour early, really on time. And let's go ahead and stand and greet our, our neighbors with Christ's love. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you for your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, 
to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in this stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all, all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to, to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in the shelter, in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning, and though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all of our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. I heard many of you clearing your throat. I've had the same virus, and I'm hoarse because of it here two months later, so I'll do the best I can with this. Our Old Testament reading today is from Numbers, chapter 21. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses, Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> o come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all live, once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seat us, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. At this time, we're blessed with our special music by the Bells of Peace. Our verse of the day is from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to be to thee, O Lord. 
Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The uh, the light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it uh, may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. This um, This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated, and we invite our children to come forward at this time. Oh, who'd you bring with you today? Yeah, who's that? Lefty? Yeah. What's up? Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Is everybody tired? Yeah. Well, I did something today that I almost never do. I brought this to church with me. What is this? A phone. phone. That's one function. What else does it do? Dale's helping out. Dale's cheating, telling him. Takes pictures. Yeah. What else does it do? It calls people. That's right. What else? Anything else? It does a lot of other things, right? But if we turn it on, what's the first thing we see? That is you. That's right. (laughs) Slightly above you. What's this? The time. Now, I have something else, and you probably seen me wearing this. What's this? A watch. A watch? I don't think it's gold, bud. That's okay, though. It's still a very nice watch. And what does this do? It tells time. Now, does anybody know how to read an old person watch? Yeah? Well, what time does it say here? It says like 4.30. 4.30? I don't think it quite says 4.30. No, it says, well... Here, let's start easier. What time does this one say? 9.21. But there's a problem. This one says 8.21. It switched up. That's right. That's why everybody's so tired. Right? Yeah, it switched up. We time traveled last night. Did you know that? We jumped an hour ahead into the future. Well, not really, but you know what I'm talking about. Yes, we had daylight savings time, and so my watch, I haven't had a chance to fix it. So it tells us that it's 821, but my phone says 
9.21. Which one's right? How come? My phone. Why? Because it automatic updates, because it's connected to the internet, all those sorts of good things. But in a sense, this one's right too, right? Because it doesn't feel like 9.21. It feels a lot more like 8.21, because it really should be 8.21. Now, when we talk about time, we see it as a straight line, right? Something happens, we can't go back and visit that. Maybe we can watch a picture or a video. Does that, is that how God views time? This is a tough one. <coughs> Luke, I'm going to ask you, is that how God sees time? No. God, our Lord is outside of time. And, and what do you think he tells us in regards to time? It tells us if it's morning time or not. You're right. In creation, he does set the great the stars and the moon and the sun to tell us if it is morning time or not morning time. But he also tells us, don't worry about tomorrow. Because who's already there? God's already there. That's right. God is already there. He's there tomorrow. He's there the day after. He's there all of the days of our future already. And he tells us, okay, another question for you. Have you guys driven along the highway and see all the, the pretty flowers that are starting to come up? There's the blue ones and the red ones, the blue bonnets. No, nobody knows what I'm talking about? Okay, well, when you drive home, look out for flowers. And Jesus tells us not to worry about what's coming in the future. He says, look how beautiful these flowers are, and tomorrow, poof, they're gone. Or look at these two little birds. Look how well the Lord takes care of them. So today, as we celebrate or don't celebrate daylight savings time, uh, we can remember that it doesn't matter, that the Lord is already there ahead of us. He tells us not to worry about what's coming tomorrow or the day after because he has already been there. And what's the really big reason that we don't have to worry about the future? The brain? The brain? Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Say it loud, nice and loud, Luke. Jesus. What did Jesus do for us? He does take care of us. How does he take care of us? He died on the cross, and what did he do three days later? Rose three days later so that we could be forgiven and promised eternal life. So it doesn't matter if it's 921 or 821, because we know where our future is. It's with Jesus. Would you guys join me in prayer if you'd repeat after me? Dear Jesus... We thank you for all the blessings that you give to us. And we pray that you would help us to remember not to worry, but to trust in you. Help us to do this each and every day. And we thank you for your death on the cross and your resurrection for each and every one of us. We pray all of this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can head back to your seats now.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, through His Son, our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Do you have any deep, dark family secrets? Notice nobody jumped up and said, I do! In one of my favorite TV shows, one of the characters comes from money, and due to some extenuating circumstances, the other P folks on the show accuse him, accuse his family of being slave owners. Well, after a, uh, a, excuse me, after a tense phone call with his parents, he announces that he has both good and bad news. His, his ancestors didn't own slaves, just the boats used to transport them. In this announcement, he is trying to justify his ancestors, at least a little bit, right? In another and much more real example, I have a family friend, and and she and her cousin decided to do a little genealogical work. Now, their grandmother tried to dissuade them from doing this. But when they didn't listen and went ahead and did it, they came upon a startling discovery. They were related to the Donner Party. Now, not hearing any big gasps, uh, for those of y'all who aren't familiar with this tragedy, let's just say it was a group of overland settlers who in 1847 became trapped in the Sierra Nevada mountains during the winter and had to make some terrible choices to survive. If you want to know more, you can Google it, but I think that's as deep as we're going to go into it in the sermon. The grandma didn't want this getting out, so she tried to stop this work. She tried to keep her uh, two granddaughters quiet about it. After those two examples, anyone feeling brave enough to stand up and share their deep, dark family secrets? Yeah, still didn't think so. But why? We didn't commit these sins. And in 99% of cases, they don't have the slightest bearing on who we are as people. And we would like to think that there's a very strong chance that if we were in the same situation, we would make very different choices. So why do we want to keep these family secrets hidden? Because we don't want to be judged by them. If they come to light, we do our best, like the the TV character, to justify them or keep others quiet about what they have learned. But it's not our ancestors' sins that we need to worry about. It's ours. Uh, Excuse me. Uh, But we do the same with our sins. We try and hide them. We try and keep them quiet or, or at best justify them. And St. John reminds us of this in verse 20 when he says, For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Like we said, with our family secrets, we might like to think we do better, but this verse is written to every person, to each and every one of us to our wicked deeds and our sins. And because of this, we don't want people to know our sins. And for good reason. They are sins. Just as we don't want our deep family secrets to be known because they are sins. And we are rightfully ashamed of them, but not for the right reason. We are ashamed of them because we don't want others to judge us, to point and laugh, or to be publicly shamed. But we should be ashamed because they separate us from our loving God. We should be ashamed because they show us just how truly broken we are. Not not to others, but to ourselves and to our triune God. And we should be ashamed because in our sins, we were dead. This is exactly what St. Paul so clearly points out in our epistle in verses 1 and 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. 
We all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were, by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We have every reason to be ashamed because of our sin, but we have one reason to not be ashamed of our sin, which is Christ Jesus, our Savior. And this is the the great promise that both our epistle and gospel writers speak to us today. John writes what I think we could all agree is probably the most famous verse in the Bible. In fact, let's read or recite it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is the message of the Bible wrapped up into one sentence. In these three clauses, we get the whole narrative. The who, the what, and the why. Who? God. Loved who? The whole sinful world. Not just those that believe, but the whole world that has, that had, and still does reject Him. Christ's death covered every single sin. He took every sin upon Himself on the cross in our stead. And what does Uh, And what did our Lord, who loved the whole world, do? Gave His only Son. Not forced, not anything else, but gave Christ up as our final and ultimate sacrifice. Why? So that we who believe would have eternal life. St. Paul echoes this, but in true pastoral fashion, what it only takes John one sentence or one verse to say, Paul takes three or four. And he, uh, here's what he says in verse four through six. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Once again, we have the who, the what, and the why here. Who? God being rich in mercy, although we did not deserve it, and full of great love, even though we were dead in our trespasses. What? made us alive in Christ, in his death and resurrection. And why? So that we would be raised up and seated with our triune God in heaven. Now Paul throws a little extra in here as well. The reason for this is that Christ is preaching to unbelievers. But Paul is specifically preaching to those who have been saved. And he says, um, uh, by grace you have been saved, to let us know the real score. It's all about Christ, not about us. So, yes, we should be ashamed of our sins, for it comes with dire and terrible consequences. Not societal or interpersonal, but in regards to our relationship with our triune God. And because of the destruction that it brings on each and every one of us. But thanks be to our Lord that He so loved us and the whole world that He gave His only Son that we might be saved. Thanks be to God that Although we were dead in our trespasses, we have been made alive in Christ, in his death and resurrection. Thanks be to our triune God that by grace we have been saved in faith, not by our own doing, but as a gift from God. 
And thanks be to our triune God that we no longer are ashamed for our sins have been completely washed away in our, um, in our Savior Jesus Christ, in his death and resurrection, because he so loved us and the whole world. Thanks be to God for these great mercies and gifts that he bestows upon us each and every day. Amen. Now may the peace which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand for the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord God, draw us into your light. Expose wherever we, like your people of old, have thought, spoken, and acted against you, that in repentance we might look to you, to your Son, lifted up on the cross, and be saved from your righteous wrath. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, you gave your only Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Bless the work of missionaries as they carry the gospel to the ends of the earth, that many may hear of your love in Christ Jesus and be saved through him. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you have set Joseph, our president, and Greg, our governor, as authorities over us for our good. Bless and sustain them with all they need to govern us that we might be ruled wisely and in accordance with your will. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, you had Moses lift up the bronze serpent, serpent in the wilderness, thereby foreshadowing your own son's lifting up on the cross. Teach us to hear in the Old Testament the promises and pictures of the coming Christ, who is uh, their Savior and ours. 
Lord, in your mercy. O God, you are our light and our salvation. Hide in your shelter, Wayne and Layla, Craig, um, Linda, Timothy, Arnold, Jeannie, Harold, the Fisher family, Doris, Linda, Brenda, Maydell, Bill, Debbie, and Kate, that they may, uh, uh, and all who suffer in, in body, mind, or soul. We pray especially for those that we've named, and we ask that you would be with them that you would watch over them, and if it is your will, you would lay your healing hand upon them. We pray this, Lord, while we also pray that your will be done. For we know, Lord, that you work all things for good for those who love you. And so we pray for this. We ask that you would comfort them and their families during these difficult times, and be with all who are in need of your care. Keep them in their day of trouble from falling into faithful, faithless fear and uphold them with your peace in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for those who serve in our armed forces and first responders. We give you thanks for Lucas Cantu, Mike Mirage, and Mike Mabry. We pray that you would continue to watch over them that you would continue to bring them home safely to their families and dwellings each and every night, and that no matter where they are, whether they be here with us today or stationed around the world, that you would send your holy gospel to them so that they may hear it and, can, and believe. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we also give you thanks and praise for the many blessings and mercies that you bestow upon us. One of uh, the big ones we want to celebrate this week is the birth of Roland Alexander and Merrick Grant Hill. We thank you for this, Lord, and we thank you that the mother and the children are doing well, and we pray that you would continue to be with them, and we ask, Lord, that you would Let these twins be a blessing to the whole Hill family, as we know that you will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, whose steadfast love endures forever, we lift up our voices in thanksgiving. You have redeemed us out of trouble and gathered us here to feed us, that our souls may not faint within us. Satisfy the longing of our hearts with your Son's good things, that we may abide in your eternal peace. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, you have made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Cause your Spirit to be at work in us, that we may not carry out the sinful desires of our bodies and minds, but be your workmanship in Christ Jesus walking in the good works he has prepared for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord and praying as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace today and forevermore. Amen, amen, amen.
Good morning, everyone. Melody Kingsbury with um, Board of Evangelism. Um, also, I'm here on behalf of Debbie Rakes. I uh, just wanted to, um, a reminder that Women of Peace is um, tonight at my house. Um, my address is on last week's bulletin or it's in the directory or if you have any questions, you can ask. So um, we're still having that tonight. Um, all are encouraged to come. Uh, my second announcement is um, thank you all for your support on last week's um, blood drive um, that we hosted. We had at least uh, 13 people who signed up and donated, um, minus three because one was rejected. Um, so that meant we saved at least 36 lives with the donation that was made. So thank you all for your generous donations. And um, also along with that, I know I um, hand out some of Freddie's coupons and I didn't realize when I looked at it, it said for Bryan, Texas only. So if you do have them, I did call Freddie's to say, well, why did you just bring this coupon for us? And it's only for Brian. <laughs> so um, they will accept it. So, um, so please, you can use them. I have um, more and I can you know, distribute them. So this is still valid at um, Freddie's and Hewitt Drive. Um, also, the last announcement is, um, we're thinking of doing an eclipse tailgate party um, on that day. Um, so I wanted to, you know, um, I'll put a sign up sheet and if we have enough people to sign up, I'll move forward and we'll, con you know, plan something, you know, again, it will be like a tailgate style where you bring your chairs, your own, um, you know, beverage and um, your, your lunch and, you know, we'll just be together for that event. Um, if I don't have enough sign-ups, then I probably will, you know, move forward with that. So um, I'll plan to have the sign-up sheet by this Wednesday. And that's all for my <laughs> announcements. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, in this morning's announcements, so we had in the inside back page a, um, a quote that I'm going to then speak to. And it says, all that we have belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. And it's from Psalm 24, verse 1. Uh, today we're starting a stewardship program, uh, not related to money, but related to time and talents. And each month uh, a layperson will um, have a little... Uh, talk, if you will, explaining uh, what God's purpose is in this for us. So I'm the first, and here goes. Mention the word stewardship to the average person, and the first thing that comes to mind is money. Somehow, most Christians equate stewardship with money, or at least with giving to the Lord's work. Make no mistake about it, money is part of what we might call total stewardship. In fact, money is a vital element of stewardship that is absolutely necessary for the work and ministry of any church to move forward. Total stewardship has rightly been likened to a three-legged stool. Money is one of the legs of that stool. Without that leg, the stool cannot stand. But the other two legs are equally important. Without them, the stool, become, the stool cannot stand either. And just what those are, are those other legs? Simply stated, they are time and talents. Total stewardship consists of the three T's, time, talents, and treasures. We've all heard this before. Remove any of one of the three, and stewardship is an, indiv is an individual life in a family and in a church like ours is severely weakened and undermined. What's really interesting is that there is a basic underlying principle that has to do with time, talents, and treasures. It's found many places in the Bible, we just read one of them, and has even been mentioned from time to time here at Peace Lutheran Church. It's this, God owns it all. That's right, God owns our time, our talents, and our treasures, it's not ours. According to Psalm 24:1, the earth and everything in it is the Lord's. That includes us. 
our time, our talents, and our treasure. So instead of being owners, we are managers. There's a vast difference between being an owner and a manager. Owners, you see, have rights. Managers have responsibilities. That's us. Owners determine how their resources will be used. Managers carry out the directives and wishes of the owner. In the final analysis, God owns it all. God is the ultimate owner of everything who, remain, who retains all of the rights of ownership. Our role is to manage what God has entrusted to us, namely our time, our talents, and our treasures. Over the next few months, which I've uh, already mentioned, we will be examining the call that God makes to us concerning the wonderful resources of time and talents that we all have. We will look closely at how we are to use our time and how we are to maximize our talents to benefit God's kingdom. We will be challenged concerning our priorities and the allocations of these, uh, of these invaluable tools. As we move forward through this series, please remember the stool called Total Stewardship and its three legs of time, talents, and treasures. Please remember the difference between an owner who has rights and a manager who has responsibilities. Above all, please keep in mind this simple but over, overpowering fact. God owns it all. As you do so, please consider the relevancy of this little chorus by Beverly Mumford. What is my life? Is it mine alone? Or does Christ call me to kneel at his throne? I'll answer his call and give him my all. And now my life is not my own. Thank you. I'll be quick. Um, I'm Nicole Hetzbeth with the Board of Education. We are collecting pre-filled Easter eggs. There's a box by the Coke machine for y'all to drop them off. Um, if y'all haven't noticed, we've had a lot of littles come in, so I'm really excited about the egg hunt and Easter service. Um, it'll be fun. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who made announcements. I think everything is pretty well covered except uh, there is some exciting news within our circuit. Next Sunday, the 17th at 3 p.m., the gathering is chartering in. And for those of you who don't spend all your time in a church office, what that means is they are officially becoming a church in the LCMS. If you go and look, I don't, I'm not even sure if they pop up on the LCMS's website, but they will as of you know, next week at 3 p.m. So they are having a get-together. I promise I wasn't playing on my phone. I was double-checking that I had all the correct information. Uh, so it is March 17th at 3 p.m., and there is a worship and then with refreshments to follow. So I would highly encourage everyone, if you're able, to go and be part of this, support our sister congregation and all that they've accomplished in a, in a short time, but, but, of course, during a difficult time. Um, Anything else? All right, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.